welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Well, we all know exercising is good for us, so why is it so hard to stay motivated? Well, on today's episode, I brought in a fitness expert to talk all about the do's and don'ts of exercise. Jennifer Cohen is a best-selling author focused on helping people build healthy habits to drive positive behavioral change. She's also the Chief Operating Officer at Suprema Fitness and the host of the Habits and Hustle podcast. Today, Jennifer and I are going to discuss the simple hacks you can use to make exercise an easy part of your routine, whether you should really go back to the gym right now, and the three things you can do today to start improving your mental and physical capabilities. Jennifer, it's great to have you on the show today. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. First topic I want to get to. Um, Fitness motivation, and I want to talk about my concept of exercise snacking, which I talk (laughs) about in the energy paradox. Um, I, I thought up of exercise snacking as a way to have people break their exercise into smaller bite-sized bits that they might actually be able to accomplish. Uh, What sort of behavioral changes do you recommend to get people moving more or exercising more? Well, I I, I read your book, um, and I love that that the name that you call you coined and exercise snacky because it kind of is a really good entry point for people to kind of break it down in their brains as a way to begin, right? The concept is smaller bits of exercise over uh, over the day, which I actually believe to be more effective, right? So we're sedentary for so long, and then we do this long 45 minute or an hour workout, and then we're sitting again. So the idea of breaking it up throughout the day into like these 10 minutes or five minute bite size uh, circuit, so to speak, yeah. or, or chunks is a very good way for people to get comfortable with exercise, but also have way better effects down along, along the line. Because if you're getting up and you're moving your, your body and your blood is circulating three times, I just feel it's just healthier for you. Um, so I actually really, I, I'm a big believer in that whole concept. And I think for people who do not like to work out, it's an easier way to kind of um, break, I kind of take it in and think, okay, you know what? I could do five minutes. I can do 10 minutes. It's less daunting and overwhelming than I'm going to now have to work out for an hour to get results, which is not true. You don't need to work out for an hour to get any health results or even physical fitness results. Yeah, well, that's, well, that's good to hear from from an expert in this. So, <laughs> so, uh, you, so you don't have to uh, necessarily uh, hop on that treadmill, which people can see behind you, the two treadmills. Um, I'm impressed. You know that you're the only person, I kid you not, the only person who knew in all of these times since COVID, I've been doing my own podcast virtually and a lot of other interviews and Zoom calls and meetings, not one person ever knew that those were treadmills. They always asked what what it was. Oh, what is that? What is behind you? They thought it was like a Game of Thrones chair. So that's good on you, you've got good eyes. Those of you who are just listening to us, she has two treadmills behind. And the reason I mention it is I I think there is this horrible misconception that you've gotta be on the treadmill for a half an hour or 45 minutes. You've gotta get your 10,000 steps a day in. Otherwise, you're a failure or right. you're not going to get a benefit. Exactly. And I'm glad that you said the word failure because that's what happens, right? When people, it's an all or nothing type of mentality, right? Like if I don't do that hour, well then forget it. I'm a failure. I'm going to go eat a box of chocolate and just sit on the couch. There's, there's no, there is a happy medium, right? You don't have to be an elite athlete and you don't have to be someone who just doesn't do anything. There is lots of, there's lots of gray in the middle. And that's what I'm saying. Like it's for, there's, you know, across the board, right? You have people who really, and who really enjoy working out and love exercising. You have people who hate it. So why not, 
you know, find something that works for you or that's less daunting. So if you're not someone who loves to work out, thinking about those small 10 minute bite sized five minute workouts still gets good results. And what I mean by that is, listen, if you are not an Olympic athlete or, you know, in a swimsuit competition, there's a lot of other benefits you can get from doing these little bouts of exercise, you know, the, the health, the, the health benefits, the mental benefits, the cognitive benefits, I mean, uh, and overall, even the physical benefits, right? I think, like I said earlier, when, when you asked me earlier, I think there's a misconception that if you don't, it's an all or nothing kind of mentality. Now, I, I personally, personally like exercise because I think what happens a lot is once you start doing something and you feel and see results, that to me is the best motivation for, for, for to, to keep on going and to keep on and to progress, right? It's the most difficult thing is just the starting process. So if you have to, if you have to start by five minutes and then, you know, eventually as you kind of get more comfortable and see, and like the feel good endorphins that you, you kind of get addicted to that five minutes will naturally turn into longer, but let yourself get there in, in bite size short in, in short term goals. So, yeah, I, I, I remember when I was a runner and read every motivational running book there was, um, the, the famous quote was the, the hardest part of any run is the first step out the door. And mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot of, a lot of truth to that saying. How, why, so everybody, you know, you're right. Everybody kind of knows uh, either instinctively or because they've read about the benefits of exercise. And maybe we'll, we'll go into some of those as we go along. But how is it, be, everybody knows this, but why is it for most people just so doggone hard to do, uh, to get motivated, to even get started at this? I think it, people are, very, are creatures of habit and people do what they've done before. So, you know, starting a new habit, uh, breaking an old habit is, it takes work and there takes, it, it's, it's, there's conviction that needs to happen. And I think that that's, a, it's human nature. Um, and so that's why it is very hard to be motivated. And also if you're, if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, a lot of people start an exercise program because of, they, of them hating how they look, right? So they're doing it for vanity purposes. I hate my, my arms. I think I'm fat. I don't like this. So then there's a lot of like shame and hate in it. And that can only last so long. So there's no longevity. But if you kind of reframe and shift the way you see it as if you're doing something good for yourself, you're taking care of yourself. I feel like that type of reframing and um, kind of how you kind of position it in your head makes a really big difference in your in the longevity of your workout and, and, and actually you even working out. And again, it's like anything else, right? Like it's because it's difficult, because it's it seems daunting, people don't like to do things that they're not good at, right? That's just, again, a part of human, that's, that's a part of human nature, that psychology. So it's easy for someone to put that in the back burner and then do things that they are good at or what they like to do. So it's really about retraining your brain, how you see exercise, how you see yourself, why you're exercising. And that helps in the overall, uh, not only your program, but in your overall motivation. But to my point earlier, I think the best motivation is always when you actually see the results and you feel you feel the results that propels anything that dominates will that dominates in any other type of motivation you know uh, i think almost a couple years ago i had a uh, author by the name of karen rinaldi who uh, had a book called suck at something and her her point she uh, she's a surfer um, and she is not a good surfer, but she, and she really sucks at surfing, but her, <laughs> she does it because she's really not very good at it, but she's, be, she's gone all around the world with her surfboard. And she, uh, she says, look, um, I like it. I know I'm not really very good at it, 
but I like it. And yes, I suck at it, uh, but I, you know, I've, I realize I like it even though I'm not very good at it. And I, th I think that's kind of an interesting way to look at it. Just be, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, I, I agree. So, you know, I get this question a lot, like what, if, you know, what should I do? What kind of exercise is the best exercise? And what I always tell people is the one that you will actually do. Right. Because at the end of the day, you're not going to do anything you really hate. Right. So find what you like. Right. And once you find what you actually like, you'll be you, you'll want to do it and it will be less, you know, awful. You know, and sometimes if you just hate everything, pick the one you hate the least and just keep on doing it. And, you know, like you're like the girl you were talking about who, you know, who likes surfing, but she sucks at it. Again, it's about like reframing how you see something just because you're bad at it. You don't have to be uh, you don't have to be an advanced performance athlete when you do these when you when you exercise. Think of it as practice. Think of it as you doing something to get better at it as practice. So you don't you're not so hard on yourself when you aren't perfect at it. Right. Like, OK, so I'm going to practice again today and I'm going to practice again like anything else in life. Right. Anything you want to get better at or get good at, it requires practice. So even if you're, uh, you know, you're trying to be an opera singer or, or a basketball player or someone who's better at working out, you know, it's all the same. It's just practicing, practicing to get better. And, you know, I'm a horrible dancer, but I like to dance. Right. So I just do that sometimes for a cardio workout just because I want to sweat and I want to just, you know, move my body. Am I good at it? No, I'm awful. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing how bad I am, actually. But I do it, you know, because I like it. And sometimes that's all it takes. It's just doing something that you like, finding something that you like. You know, the one thing about um, COVID and the last year of being kind of stuck indoors in, your, in, in a pandemic is, you know, in the fitness business, there's been a plethora of things that kind of, kind of evolved and morphed. You know, connected fitness has become really popular. Um, tons of, you know, fitness professionals, trainers, group fitness people, they've all kind of taken their business model and moved it, you know, virtually online. So there's so much to choose from now. Or you can go to YouTube and you can just like Google whatever. And there's a bazillion workouts that you can choose from. So now better than ever, there, you, it, there really isn't an excuse not to find something or try different things. You know, like go on YouTube and, you know, Fine. Try an ab workout. Try a Zumba class. Try, you can try so much trial and error, and eventually, hopefully, you'll find one thing that you hate the least, and maybe, hopefully, if you're lucky, you find something that you kind of like. You know? Yeah, that's a great point. I, I wrote in uh, in one of my books. Um, my uh, my wife talked me into some spin classes years ago, and uh, it was a type of spin class that was called Rhythm Ride. And rhythm ride, you actually move on the bike to songs, to a rhythmic song. And it, yeah. it's like dancing on the bike is the best way to explain it. And like you, I'm a horrible dancer. And so my wife was profoundly embarrassed that I, I couldn't get these moves down on the bike. And she went up to the fitness instructor, Mike, and she said, you know, I just got to apologize for my husband. He, he's just horrible at this and just ignore him. And he says, are you kidding? Have you seen the big smile on his face? I don't care what he's doing. He's having a great time. And I eventually did learn how to do it, but that's the point. You know, I really sucked at it, but I was having a yeah. great time. And it's actually still one of my favorite exercise experiences, rhythm ride on in a spin bike. So. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I, exactly. I totally hear what you're saying. I mean, like, um, when I was, when I was pregnant, you know, I couldn't, when I, when I was really getting like eight months, like I was like doing Zumba classes just because I, it got me, I can at least do that. It made me move a little bit. Now I looked ridiculous and I was terrible at it, but you know what? At the end of the day, who cares, right? Like I was having a good time. People are so preoccupied and focused on what others think of them, what others perceive them as. And the reality is everyone's so concerned with themselves and watching themselves. No one's been paying attention to you that much. Right. But, and so that's also part of it. Like people are, are scared to try something new because they're scared of how uh, what others are going to perceive them as. 
And like, if they realize early on that no one's like, everyone's so preoccupied with how they are, they're not even paying attention. It would allow for people to try much more activity, to do much more things, you know, go to the gym once it's opened. Um, you know, because a lot of people hate working out at the gym for that exact reason, right? They're, 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 they feel shame that they're not good at something. And so it's a, it's a shame. Do you, do you think COVID has, has maybe helped that in one way that you now can make a fool of yourself at home without anybody yes. watching? Absolutely. You know, the first company and the first book I ever wrote was called, my first company is called No Gym Required. And I wrote a book called No Gym Required with it. Um, and the whole book was uh, about giving people simple and easy ways to stay healthy and fit. It wasn't fan it wasn't fancy stuff, but you know what people people sometimes like the fancy because they think that that's going to you know, work better. But they, at the end of the day, you can be just as healthy and fit and strong um, by not going to the gym because it really doesn't require the gym. And I'm not saying the gym is bad. I mean, I love going to the gym for all other reasons. But at the end of the day, you can you really can get everything and anything you need in the health, wellness, fitness, in terms of like things that help you out without, without relying on one. And I think what COVID has done is proven that point over and over again. And the reality is, you know, going to a gym, that takes a lot of extra time that most of us don't really have, right? Driving to the gym, changing, talking and socializing. By the time you finish that whole, like, you know, rigmarole you get like four and a half minutes of exercise and two hours of socialization <laughs> and you know what i mean but then you think to yourself oh i did something now it's so like much more efficient and way more effective by working out at home right like i said earlier by doing that youtube video or finding whoever you like on whatever fitness person you like and doing their workouts virtually or um or there's so many different programs and the reality is you don't, that doesn't require a gym. And so it's everything from, and you, you know, this, I mean, this is what you do for a living. So much of all of this is diet and what you eat, what you put into your body. Exercise can take you only so far. And then it's basically what you're putting in your mouth. That is basically the, the real driver of all of this back home, right? right? You can work out to the cows come home, but if you're eating crappy food, it makes no difference. No, that's very true. I, I still have so many people that say, um, you know, I've got this amazing exercise routine and I've got, you know, all this great health and what am I doing with coronary artery disease? Or you're telling me I'm a diabetic and I, you know, I'm this exercise fanatic. That's impossible. You're, you know, you're wrong. Well, you know, the numbers don't lie and your angiogram exactly. didn't lie. Uh, but yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I hear that too all the time. I think people also don't know what they don't know, right? And they fool themselves into um, what they're actually putting in their mouths. And so, you know, even with me, they'll be like, oh, you don't understand why I gained five pounds. I've been working out like a dog, to your point, every single day, and this is happening. And then I'm like, they're like, all I had was like a bowl of oatmeal and a blueberry. And then you figure out, well, that whatever that, whatever that pr product was, they probably had a portion for five people. And that's, you know what I mean? Which is, again, way, people always underestimate the amount of calories they're eating. They never overestimate. They underestimate it. And they also don't realize how some foods can affect their bodies differently and therefore have all other sorts of, of other things. So I always tell people a great way to kind of manage and monitor your weight um, and what you're consuming, because that is 80% of it, is track your food, track your calories. There's tons of apps out there even for free where you can actually track all this. So in real time, you can see what you're doing and then have an educated and a, pl you're, you're a place where then you can make actual different choices and tweak your program based on like real actual information that's in front of you as opposed to just like guessing. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I still, early on, I, I, I made people fill out a, a two-week food diary and 
we, we, gave it, we gave it to them to fill out and bring it back. And I still use it every now and then when I have a, a person who just doesn't quite get it. And I recently gave this 70-year-old uh, woman who's uh, very overweight, I'll be kind, um, and uh, said, you know, she's, and she's diabetic, insulin resistant, and she swears she's doing a, a keto diet. And she keeps gaining weight. And I said, oh, you know, there's, something's not adding up here. Uh, let's have you do a, a two-week food diary. And she said, okay. And I said, I'll you know, meet you back in the office in two weeks, we'll go through it. So she comes in and she hasn't lost any weight. And I said, okay, let's, let's start looking at the food diary. And she said, well, I didn't bring it in. And I said, well, what are you, you, know, what are you doing here? She said, well, I realized that um, I, was, I was not eating what I was telling you I was eating. And I, you know, and I would just say, oh, well, you know, I ate this, but that doesn't count. Um, and I would, yes. you know, that, that doesn't count. Or, you know, well, I had a luncheon I had to go to, and that doesn't count. <laughs> and and she, said, she said, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm wasting your time because I, I, I realize everything I'm doing doesn't count. And, exactly. Yeah. It's so funny. I hear this. I, the same thing happens with me all the time. I totally understand what you're saying. And uh, or they just don't they just don't tell you the truth. They're like they, they put on what they want you to see uh, and then you, they, you, they leave out the other stuff or they forget to put the other stuff on. But, you know, one one plus one equals two. Right. So I feel like at the end of the day, if you really want to make a change and you really want to get healthier or um, have more fat loss or whatever the reason is that you're trying to do, whatever you're trying to do, it's important to be honest with yourself, right? And have self-awareness where your pitfalls are, where your triggers are, because that's how you could actually fix the problem and mitigate these, you know, these, these other issues where it is, oh, um, that doesn't count or, you know, hiding it. Because at the end of the day, you're only doing that to yourself. Um, I believe that everybody has the ability to be healthier. Not everyone has the ability to be skinny, but everyone has the ability to be stronger and healthier, which are, I think, really positive goals to, to try to achieve. Um, and so if we can shift the messaging from just vanity and body and just over overall, like overall healthier uh, ways to see it, I think that's also a, a more positive way to get people to feel more and not just inspired but feel feel better about um attempting these things yeah i think um i think going down that road um this is not about your looks it's not about swimsuit competition uh women in particular uh, i've written about this women have far greater Alzheimer's development than men, which actually shocks most people. Yeah. So women are far more vulnerable to developing Alzheimer's than men. And this amazing study, which I've written about in my books, looking at women, comparing women who exercise regularly throughout their lives to women who don't exercise regularly, and looking at the onset of dementia, the women who regularly, and exercise, uh, have an 80% reduction in developing dementia compared to the women who don't exercise. And I can tell you right now, if the pharmaceutical company came out with a pill that would give women an 80% reduction in developing Alzheimer's, you would spend your life savings for that pill. I, I would too. And yeah, you're, you're right. There it is right in front of us. And the other really cool thing is that women who carry the ApoE4 gene, who I treat a lot, um, if they get dementia, that dementia occurs 11 years later than the women who carry the ApoE4 gene who don't exercise. And, and quite frankly, so that's a difference of going from getting Alzheimer's at 80 to getting Alzheimer's at 91. And you know, 91, eh, that's a pretty good, uh, think, think of the things you could do yeah, with yeah. your, you know, grandkids or your great grandkids in your 80s that you would, you know, totally miss. And it's all for just having a regular exercise program. And it no, I, I totally agree with you. I think so much of this is lifestyle 
factors that we can all modify and tweak to be healthier, right? Obviously, fitness is a, a big component of that, as is diet and other environment, whatever else, environmental factors. You know, I, I also read something yesterday about Alzheimer's and exercise. And, you know, it's funny how we all turn to walking as the, it's the easiest thing to do. You walk out of your house, you can walk around the block. You know, it's great for your heart. You know, I don't have to tell you, you're a car, you know, we know who you are. Um, I'm telling, I'm telling a, a heart doctor about what's good for your heart. But <laughs> um, resistance training has been shown to be the most effective way, uh, way to help prevent or um, offset any, you know, early stage Alzheimer's than even walking because of all the benefits of the, that, that resistance training does. Um, and so I think that that's a really, as, as we age, I think it's really important for women and men, of course, to really kind of integrate the resistance training portion of their fitness or, or component into their life. Now I'm not saying you've got to go and like lift, you know, hundred pound dumbbells. You can get resistance training from a lot of different forms. Body weight movements is resistance training yep. using your own body weight, right? Um, resistant bands is a great way to do it. Uh, obviously dumbbells are great. Uh, so I think it's so important as you age that those things are really kind of, uh, introduced, uh, for bone density and including, you know, there's just, uh, just on the cognitive level, on the physical level. Uh, I can't stress that part enough. Yeah, it's true. Uh, and I write in the energy paradox that resistant training actually makes a new class of of hormones called myokines uh, that are produced in our right. muscles. And myokines, among other things, go to our brain and actually help stimulate the mitochondria and neurons. Um, and I'll mention something, I think I mentioned it before. Uh, I, I consider Jack Lane the godfather of fitness. And uh, I'm old enough to remember my mother watching him uh, <laughs> in his kind of leotard. And I, uh, in his later life, I got to knew Jack, and he was a consultant at our Arthritis Institute at our hospital. And Jack used to say that there were only two exercises for perfect fitness that you could do at home, and that would be a plank and squats, deep knee bend. And he said, it, you actually activate every muscle group there is with those two exercises. And, yeah. you know, and like I write in the energy paradox, look, you're brushing your teeth twice a day. Just do, do deep knee bends while you're brushing your teeth for a couple of minutes. And you can, you can binge watch your favorite Netflix show while, while doing a plank. <laughs> yeah, you're talking my language. I'm telling you, I, I could not agree with more. That was like my whole No Gym Required book was all about these little trick tips and tricks. And, uh, it's much more, it's so, it's so much easier than people want to think it is to integrate these things. Right. Cause they think of resistance training as going to the gym and being like a meathead and, and lifting tons of weight. But like you said, brushing your teeth while you do some, a few body squats, while you get while, waiting for the water to boil in your kitchen, you know, for tea or whatever, do 10 air squats, you know, do 10 uh, you know, do a plank for 30 seconds. And, you know, of course, Jacqueline, I could not agree with him more. I think that the plank and the squat are two of the top exercises that you can do for, for strengthening your body because it works multiple muscles at the same time. You're holding your own body weight. I mean, I also like push-ups. if you can do push-ups, right? Um, basic moves like doesn't require any money, doesn't require any gym membership. It requires just a little bit of motivation and determination to, to do it. And, you know, besides all of this, the thing that you need the most, the most important thing is consistency, right? If you do it one time and then like, all right, I worked out, I did a couple squats. I don't have to do it again until, you know, next month. <laughs> it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's moot, pointless. Consistency versus an over intensity every single time, 
right? Consistency is so much more important than intensity. If you go to the gym and kill it and you're sweating and you're crushing it and you just do that once in a while, it's not even close to as effective. If you just do a little bit, you know, every couple of days, every day, maybe five, 10 minutes, if you, if that's all you want to do way more effective over time for your longevity. All right. So you're a working mom. Um, how, how do you get around the fact that I hear all the time? I'm too busy. Uh, I've, you know, I've got, got to get them 27 places. This was pre COVID, but I'm, I'm too busy. Uh, I, I, I don't have time for myself. I'm, I'm only here for my kids. So, you know, I don't, you, you obviously don't know me very well, but, um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, what I, do you tell your mom? What do you tell everybody? I, 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 I don't like, I say no excuses. I think that if something is a priority to you, you make it, you, you, there's, it's a non-negotiable. I think everybody should have non-negotiables in their life. And no matter what, they are not going to let that thing slip. Now, in my opinion, and uh, as a working mom who also runs two companies and has a podcast and, you know, I can, the list can go on and on. Uh, time is not my friend. However, what I think that's important for people to understand is that energy that you get is not the energy that you put into exercise. The energy that you get out is way more beneficial because that gives you the, I have more energy and I'm more productive when I work out versus when I'm, when I don't. So the days that are the craziest and the hectic and most hectic, and I have really no time in my schedule, that is the day I'm going to wake up, you know, 30 minutes early and make sure no matter what non-negotiable, I'm going to work out because throughout that entire day, I'm much more on point. I'm much more focused. I'm much more alert. I'm much more productive and I have more energy. So it, that, what I think I really would love people, your listeners to, to know, and if they don't know this, I mean, people talk about this constantly, right? But working out gives you more energy than if you didn't work out, if you just let yourself get past that hurdle and see for yourself, you know, you don't know what you don't know until you know. And so, uh, I really think how, I think that's super important. And also when you take care of yourself, you're so much better to take care of other people, right? Like making yourself a little bit of a priority and also showing that as a, as a, as kind of a role model, I want my kids to see me exercising. I want them to understand these healthy habits early on, you know, that how important it is for, for, you know, for my mental health, your physical health, just them taking care of myself. That's how kids learn, right? They learn from, from watching you, from watching others. And you want to show them, not just tell them, you want to show them. So I, I, I really can't, this is super, I'm super passionate about this because I, I know people use that all the, that excuse all the time. I don't have time, but you have time to get your hair, you know, straightened or you, to blow dry your hair. You have time to uh, put your makeup on. I'd rather look like hell. Like I always do. I don't wear makeup. I wear like my sweaty clothes. I'd rather have that be the thing that gets put on the back burner than me and my exercise routine. So let me look like crap for you. I don't care ah. as long as I feel good. <laughs> good. Good point. Well, you don't, you don't look like crap. So it's, something's working. Yeah. Exactly. So you, you bring up oh. a good point. Uh, our, our, our children, this generation's children are, are some of the least exercising group of children, maybe in the history of mankind. Um, yes. What do we do about that? That's a big problem. Big problem. Uh, and, and COVID did not help matters in any way, shape or form. And it's really, because, it's really an issue. I've seen it myself with my, with my little eight year old boy who actually prior to COVID, he was the most energetic kid in his class was in 50, like five different sports. You, I mean, I had to like, I would have to take him around. Like, you know, when you walk your dog for exercise, I would have to walk him at night after dinner, just at, like I would a dog, just to kind of get the energy out. Then cut to COVID happening. The screens become your best friend. You're on, you're doing school virtually. And that kind of bleeds into doing video games on the iPad and the TV. And it becomes habit. Um, 
And I think it's a real problem. The screens have become a real hindrance. And I think every parent could, could, could relate to this. Uh, number one, I think you got to lead by example to my first point. I was saying earlier, if you, the parent see it as a priority to exercise and work out and be active by doing different sports, by doing different activities, you don't have to be, uh, like I said, you don't have to be in the gym two hours, but you have to be doing other things as an example, like going outside for long walks or hikes or, uh, doing like, you know, dance classes together, doing things together, like maybe you know, taking up a tennis lesson or group exercise, you know, but not tennis, well, other things outside, like throwing a ball outside. I think leading by example is the number one thing. I think um, making it somewhat enjoyable, finding again, activities for them that they could enjoy. Now, I hope that now with things opening up again, uh, the social element is such a critical part where, you know, I should also say bike riding as a family or things like that, finding activities you can do together, help your children see and feel the difference of being active and limiting the iPad and limiting uh, screen time is so important because then they kind of have no other choice but to be more active. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say is even with kids, and we talk about this a lot with adults, like how do you know, we get motivated as an adult or what do, what do adults do? I think everybody needs goals in life, right? So like if you are someone who's starting, it doesn't matter if you're eight, 10 years old, or if you're 50 years old, try to have something to kind of work towards. Like if it's a 5k, you know, have your child work towards some type of goal as well. Um, I think it's very important to kind of instill those messages super early on. So it's ingrained in their brain. And it's not the iPad or the, or the screen time that they're seeking. It's the, it's the seeking of like the outdoors, the fresh air, the social, the socializing of doing team sports with their friends where they, they kind of relate some kind of movement to fun and to a good time. If that makes sense. Yeah, it makes great sense. Well, uh, hopefully with COVID, uh, Hopefully coming under control, maybe we, everybody can get outside again and the kids can play again together and we'll hope. So it's happening slowly but surely, thankfully so. All right, I want to I pivot to some quick tips. So what's the, what's the best advice you've ever received? And it doesn't have to be related to fitness, but you can have a fitness advice if you want. Uh, but the best advice I've ever received was... Oh my God. That's a, that's a big question. Uh, oh, just choose one. And anything. Well, I'll tell you the best, uh, the best advice is, um, less thinking, more doing. So you can like, you know, it's like a la analysis paralysis, right? You can outthink and over, you can outthink and overthink too much where they end up doing nothing. I think having the, uh, to, to, to move more in terms of act more, be it professionally and personally, physically, mentally, whatever, and stop thinking about it. I think that was one, that I, and I don't know who told me that, and I instilled that really, really young on it, young in my life, and I've never looked back. Um, and so I would say that would be a great piece of advice. Perfect, all right, great. And you've, you've spoken to a lot of uh, knowledgeable people on your podcast. Uh, have you learned? And you're gonna be one of them. Oh no, so yeah, good. <laughs> uh, what's the most fascinating or, or potentially powerful thing you've learned from your podcast experience? You know what, I, I don't, the most, fa it's, it's interesting. I wouldn't say there has been one most fascinating because I think that a lot of people I've spoken with have something about their particular story is fascinating or interesting in, in different ways. But I will tell you a through line that I've seen a lot is resilience, right? The idea that these people have never, every, everything that I've seen, and, and also not just on my podcast, but in life that all the different people I've met in my personal life and professional life, I think that success doesn't happen overnight. And I think that's a, 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 it's a fallacy and it's a fallacy that gets people in trouble. I think that resilience has been the through line, uh, falling down and getting back up again, perseverance. I think that there are certain like qualities and value and, and people that 
that in people that really strive to be to for success in a lot of different ways have gotten comfortable with the idea of failure and the idea of uh, basically falling and getting back up again. And I think that's been something that I think is, I guess I wouldn't say I'm fascinated by it, but I would say that I appreciate that. And I, um, I love hearing that, right. Cause I think it's very much something that people who are in, in you know, kind of doing it in they're in, the, they're in the middle of their journey need to hear. I think it's a powerful, a powerful statement that just because you're not where you want to be today, doesn't mean you're not going to be there and then some later on if you just persevere. And it's like I said, if you fall, get back up and the resilience aspect. Yeah, I think that's very important. I, I've interviewed a lot of uh, super old people around the world uh, figuring out you know, what makes them tick. And one of the things that uh, I've written about is they all have what I call p- pessimistic optimism. And <laughs> yes. And, and they, they know bad things are going to happen to them. And they don't know when, but they have the ability to shrug when that happens. And they go, you know, that, that's it. That, yeah, okay, that happened. And let's just keep moving past that. It's, it's like, okay, yeah, you stumble, but you get right back up. Yeah. Absolutely. It's true. I like that. Pessimistic optimism is exactly... I think it's, it's a very important tool to have in your toolbox. Yep. All right. Uh, give me one thing that our listeners can do at home to get their exercise going. Just one thing that they can do at home. One thing? What about you can do at home? Like, I think we're going to, let's stay on course, uh, Dr. Gundry. I'm going to say what we said before. I want them to do, I want them to have a goal. I, I want them to do, 25 squats and they can break it up into fives, you know, and they could do it all at the same time if they want, or they can do it. They can, they can divide them up over the day, but I think 25 squats and I'm going to even say something else and a 25 second plank to begin. And they can to begin by doing, you know, half five seconds if they have to, whatever they need to do to get comfortable with the movement and the motion and get their brain in a place where, they're, you know, kind of committed to the to movement, activity, and exercise. And again, there's no excuse. That doesn't take much time. You could do it while you're breakfast, you know, you're, you're boiling the water or doing whatever you're doing in the kitchen, um, waiting for your chicken to make, get, you know, to bake, whatever it is. Yeah. You know? That's great. All right, everybody. 25. We'll get, get yeah. Two. Oh, and I want to also say increase your hot, your, your water intake. That's another one. You know, people don't drink enough water. They don't hydrate enough. So before they get out of bed, I want them in every night to, to get a glass of water, put it beside their bed stand. And before they get out of bed, drink that glass of water. They're not allowed to leave that bedroom until they finish that one glass of water. All right. Speaking of water, you're, you're excited about a few projects. Uh, one of them might be water. <laughs> That's true. I, oh, I, it is. How did you know? It's, this is what this is one of them. It's called BLK Water. I was going to ask you about this later because um, of all the different health benefits that this water has. It's black, and it's um, it has sulfuric minerals in it. Do you know what that is? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so lots of health benefits. It helps with detoxification. It helps with um, nutrients absorption, and it's uh, it's great. It's one of the things I am really excited about, actually. Oh, very good. Oh, yeah. And then I can tell you other things like supplements I take or things that people could do that's, you know, as they age. But I don't want to bore you if you don't want to hear it. So, <laughs> Well, we, I think the, the main thing we want to get across is let's get people moving. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's brilliant that you've, you know, written books that you, you know, you can do this at home. You, know, you don't have to, you are your own gym in a way. No, absolutely. You can do all of this at home. All of this stuff doesn't take anything but just a little bit of motivation and and uh, desire. Yeah. And let's protect our brains, ladies, please. And boy, yes. I tell you, movement is is the cheapest, easiest way to protect your brain. We can take all the supplements we want, and don't don't get me wrong. I'm a big supplement fan, but 
wow, uh, you know, movement and protect your brain, why not? Absolutely. I could not agree with you more. Exactly. All right, Jennifer, it's great having you on the show. Uh, where can listeners find all about you and your work? Uh, they can find me. Uh, thank you for having me. And they can find me at the real Jen Cohen on Instagram. Uh, they can also find me at my website, jennifercohen.com. They can listen to Habits and Hustle uh, where you, wherever you listen to your podcast. And I think that's about it. All right. All right. Well, thanks again. And uh, hopefully I'll be on your show soon. Yeah, you will. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Uh, okay, now it's time for our audience question. Dan from Australia asks on drgundry.com, I really appreciate all the information you provide. After 40 years of searching, following your approach, I finally feel a significant improvement in my health and happiness. I strictly follow the Gundry process. I'm interested to know your opinion on taking vitamin supplements during a time-restricted meal approach. If eating between noon and 6 p.m., is it detrimental on digestion metabolism to be taking supplements outside of this time, i.e. NADH, ubiquinol, L-carnitine in the morning, say 8 a.m., and glycine magnesium capsules at, say, 9 p.m.? Where does the timing of taking supplements fit into the paradox? With thanks and enduring gratitude. Well, Dan, that's a great question. Uh, supplements... Uh, are not going to impact your feeding window. And in fact, uh, as you know, uh, I don't eat breakfast and I take my supplements uh, in the morning uh, on an empty stomach. And I will take some supplements late uh, before bed. And we've, we've seen and looked at patients who have done this. I've looked at my own blood work. And they don't affect the good effects of the time-restricted feeding. So go ahead and take your supplements. Just don't take your supplements and then have a fruit smoothie to wash them down. That's what you don't want to do. Uh, now it's time for the review of the week. This week's review comes from EMB on Apple Podcasts, who says, I first came across Dr. Gundry on other podcasts while he was promoting the longevity paradox. Since then, it's been a fascinating rabbit hole of science studies and food. For someone who has followed and been affected by nutrition for as long as I have, shockingly, nothing he says is shocking. It all has basis in diets such as Adkins, keto, paleo, carnivore, vegetarian, and vegan. And he goes so far to explain what these diets actually get right what parts are non-consequential, and yes, of course, what parts they don't get so right. Not only this, but he also is not beholden to any beliefs. If better science and studies come out contradicting or clarifying something he has said, he will revise that in a future book and make sure to let everyone know right here. Absolutely one of the best voices in health and nutrition today. Wow. Well, thank you, EMB. For a great review. And it's reviews like this that help us reach a bigger audience for our transformative health message. So if you haven't already, please, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And while you're there, feel free to drop in any health questions you have. I'll be sure to answer them in a future episode. Because I'm Dr. Gundry and EMB and the rest of you, I'm always looking out for you. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Mm -hmm.